so upset. Where? Don't find my husband, pilot! Pilot! Where's my husband? Someone find him! I'm coming, him. I'm coming. I'll, I'm here, what do you need? I've been outside doing something important here. Did you lose your keys again? No! It's not my keys, it's not my phone. I had the worst dream ever. I've suffered so much on account of this dream. Pilot, you know, you know that Jesus who, who, who's in the city, he's been performing miracles and, and he just overturned the tables of the temple? Like, I, I know he might cost you money, but you, husband, you could have nothing, nothing to do with him. Do not get involved. Well, it's a little late for that. He's here. Jesus is here. What, wait, what do you mean here? Here in Jerusalem? Here in our home? Somewhere here? Uh, yes, right here. What is he doing here? Caiaphas had him arrested last night. The chief priest, they had their trial. Now he's here, and they want him crucified. Crucified? What could he possibly have done to deserve that? This man is innocent. I know it. I've seen it in my dream. That's the problem. I don't think he's done anything wrong. Caiaphas and the priests, they said that he claims to be the son of God. Well, then I asked him, and guess what? He talks in riddles or he's silent. I told the, the leaders, judge him under his own laws. But they said they don't have the power to crucify. What do I do? Pilot. Pilot, listen. I know you don't usually listen to me. You, no, you don't that, listen, but right. you need to listen now. Do not have anything to do with this. Don't. Well, they said that Jesus claims to be the king of the Jews, which it's an offense to Caesar. But when I ask him if he's the king of the Jews, he's silent. I told you, he talks in riddles. I find no fault in him. So now there's millions of Jews outside, and, and I'm, I'm afraid of him. I'm afraid of a revolt. That's what you're afraid of. Yeah. You're afraid of a revolt. Listen, don't be so weak. You should be afraid of more than that. I'm telling you, husband of mine, you need to steer clear. After all, don't you know that you have the power to crucify him or to set him free. It's time to man up and set him free. I know I'm right. I, I'm always right. Well, I don't know about that one. But I told Jesus that. You know what he said? I wrote it. The scribes wrote it down for me. This is what he said. You can have no power at all against me unless it's given from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, see what I'm afraid of? See what I'm afraid of? I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting a mic. Well, oh, I have an idea. I have a great idea. Uh, yeah, what's that? Isn't it the custom of the Jewish people to release one prisoner at Passover? That's right. Maybe you could offer them a different prisoner. After all, many people still love Jesus. Well, I did. They didn't, they didn't want Jesus. They wanted Barabbas to be released. Barabbas? Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas released. I, oh, no, I'm going to wash my hands of this. I'm done. You know, Pilate, my husband, he said he washed his hands of this. But you know what? He still had Jesus flogged. He still sentenced him to the cross. He still wrote King of the Jews on the cross in three different languages. He judged the only one who should ever judge. Oh, I'm in agony. I'm in agony. What I saw in my dream, I'm afraid I'm afraid for what's to come for my husband. Wash his hands of this? Huh. 
It's one of the more interesting stories we find on the way to the cross. It's only Matthew's gospel that records this story and this exchange that happens, and it's only a sentence we read inside of Matthew's gospel. The story is exactly as has been portrayed. I, I want to take you then, if I could, to Matthew's gospel just to work down through with you how Matthew records this exchange. And so I think it's in chapter 27 of, of Matthew's gospel, and let's, we're going to put it on the screen <clears throat> in just a moment so you can have a chance to see that. And, and Matthew records this as the historical account, as Jesus now has been arrested. He has stood before uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, stood before the Jewish people, and they wanted him, because they had no ability to crucify him, they wanted him crucified. They would rather live without Jesus than live with him. And so as a result, they sent him to Pilate. And here is how Matthew's gospel uh, talks about this exchange. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, the governor, and asked him, he asked, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, uh, you have said so. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, Jesus gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony that they're bringing against you? But Jesus, again, made no reply. I think it's Isaiah who uses the term that he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and said no words. To the great amazement of the governor, he couldn't believe that there was no self-defense for Jesus in the midst of that. Let's go to the next slide. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. And at that time, it was a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas, or Jesus Barabbas. Jesus being a very common first name, or very common name, certainly, in the day of Scripture. And so when the crowd had gathered, Pilate stood in front of them and said, Which one would you like me to release to you? Would you like Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who has been called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest. They wanted Jesus Christ, the Messiah, eliminated. And so Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat. His wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and have Jesus executed. And so, Pilate stands in front of all of the people which of the two do you want me to release to you, said the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do with the one who is called Jesus the Messiah, Pilate asked. We want you to crucify him. I want to think with you for a few moments today about this rather unusual sentence that only Matthew includes in his description of the crucifixion of Christ. Pilate was seated on the judge's seat and his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with him. He's an innocent man. Now, pause with me and think for just a moment. This is the only witness, the only witness, the only person inside of the entire crucifixion of Jesus' account, the entire crucifixion in the narrative, this is the only person who makes a statement to the innocence of Jesus Christ. It's Pilate's wife. It's his wife. Don't have anything to do with him. He's an innocent man. 
And then she says, I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Now, listen, if you were only to go ahead and keep all of this examination just contained to the Bible, this is the only sentence you have about Pilate's wife. You have to go outside of the Bible to actually even get her name. So material contained in the Bible, biblical information or biblical literature, when you go outside of the Bible into historical accounts or into uh, other pieces of literature, they call that extra biblical. Okay, Extra biblical. And that's where you have to go to even learn a little bit about Pilate's wife. Here's the only person inside of the entire narrative that says Jesus is innocent. Now, <clears throat> you have to go to a piece of literature that was called the Acts of Pilate. A-C-T-S, the Acts of Pilate, but it was later then renamed called the Gospel of Nicodemus. And it is extra biblical material. It's part of what's called apocryphal literature. And in the fourth chapter, you have this account about this section of scripture. Then came a messenger from Claudia Procula, the wife of Pilate. That's her name. Her name is Claudia or Procula. And sometimes that's even spelled a little different. Claudia Procula. Don't have anything to do with him. He's innocent. And then again, in this same extra biblical material, you read, she says, take care. Don't agree that evil should happen to Jesus because he's a good man. Now, you don't read that inside the Bible. Again, this is extra biblical material. It comes along several years after the gospel account, actually. But it's fascinating, then, to consider how Claudia stands and says to Pilate, listen, if you'll just listen to me, if you'll just listen to me, you'll be in a better situation. But Pilate doesn't listen, and you're well aware of that. As a matter of fact, Pilate then is the one who goes down through history, and in history, he has a name similar to Judas, right? I mean, people just don't name their children Judas for good reason. Similar, they don't name their children Pilate, or they don't call churches Saint Pilate because he's vilified. He's the one who sends Jesus to the cross. He has the opportunity to go ahead and to release him. Don't have anything to do with him. He's innocent. Where this really stands out for historians or people in church history, at the beginning of the third century, the church begins to say and to recite especially around Easter and right around times of baptism. Let's go to the next slide if we could. This is part of a creedal statement. Some of us have grown up in church when we make this statement. It's things that we believe. It's a concise statement about our belief system. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin. And there's Pontius Pilate. His name is said thousands of times every single Sunday. There he is, right smack in the middle of the Apostles' Creed. He had the chance. Let him go, said Claudia. Don't crucify him. Let him go. You know, you can't make your way through the Easter season, and certainly you can't make your way through Holy Week without once again asking yourself the same question that Pontius Pilate, that Claudia asked 
about Jesus Christ. What am I going to do with him? What am I going to do with him? If he is the Messiah, the whole world changes. If he isn't the Messiah, isn't it better that one person dies instead of an entire cultural riot surrounding Jesus who's called the Christ? Pontius Pilate was in a difficult situation. Let's go to the next slide. It's fascinating, though, that Mrs. Pilate, we know just a little bit more about. Again, the Acts of Pilate or the Gospel of Nicodemus, this extra biblical material in a different section. And Pilate, summoning the Jews, says to them, listen, you know my wife, notice this, you know my wife is a worshiper of God. And she prefers to adhere to the Jewish religion. Do you know down through church history, in some segments around our world, that Mrs. Pilate was actually venerated? So that on October the 27th, if you have any friends who are from a Greek Orthodox background or an Eastern Orthodox church, Mrs. Pilate, she has a day all to herself on the calendar. Why? Listen, don't have anything to do with him. He's innocent. Something about the dream she had compelled her to consider Who Jesus Christ really was. Something about the dream she had encountered. You know, there is even debate about that. If you read down through the history of the church, some would write that it was a compelling picture of Jesus Christ, the one who is the Lord of all, crucified, And long before he actually went to the cross, that Mrs. Pilate saw him on the cross and recognized that he was innocent. And as a result of that, that's the reason she sends note to, she sends word to Pontius. Don't have anything to do with him. He's innocent. We are going to kill a person who does not deserve it. Others have said that the dream that she had was not given by God at all, but some have said it was given by Satan or the enemy of her heart and life, maybe somehow trying to persuade Pontius not to send Jesus to the cross, which would then alter the course of salvation history. I don't know that you have legs to stand on, in either one of these arguments. But here's the fascinating thing. Oh, Pilate, he can't get the blood of Jesus off his hands. One theologian said that for all of eternity, Pilate is going to be rubbing his hands until they're raw, trying to go ahead and cleanse them from the blood of Christ. You know, I think that inside of the Lenten season, that's what compels us with these two characters. Pontius Pilate, who the tradition, history says, that when One of the bloodthirsty emperors came to the throne. He executed Pilate. Pilate goes into a godless eternity. Forever.
but Claudia. That may be another story. A historian around the same time as a guy named, or a little bit later than a guy named Eusebius, his name is Origen, which is a kind of a tough first name to begin with, but that's his name. His name's Origen. And, and Origen, in one of his books that he wrote about the 25th chapter of Matthew and then on into the crucifixion of Christ, he said this, Pilate's wife became a believer. Her husband, I don't want a thing to do with him. The wife, he's innocent. Now, some people, some people think that, let's go to the next slide, that when Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 is working down through a list of names, he says, oh by the way, do your best to get here before winter and Eubulus greets you and so does Pudens, Linus. Is that her? Is it possible that that's Mrs. Pontius Pilate? Don't have anything to do with him. He's innocent. I can't seem to get his blood off of my hands. This classic piece of art on our next slide really illustrates exactly what we've read about in Matthew's gospel. So what do you want me to do with Jesus? And then in the foreground, there she is as she slips off of the balcony, knowing that Christ is not only innocent, but has the ability to transform a person's heart and life. Certainly not the first marriage, the first relationship where one spouse is pleading with the other, please listen to him. Please listen to him. And maybe, just maybe, Mrs. Pontius Pilate becomes a person who is influential inside of the early church because her life was transformed. But Pontius... couldn't get the blood of Jesus off of his hands. Every single calendar year, we have a seven-week block, the church. Forty days, not including Sundays, where we have to reconsider the same question that Pontius Pilate and Claudia had to consider. What do you do with him? If he is the Messiah, then we bow at his feet. If he's not the Messiah, we can't seem to get away from him. I'm going to ask the music team if they'll come back to the platform and, and they'll close our service and if you'll remain seated as they make their way back to the platform they're going to sing a song that reminds us that we have a God who is overall and certainly during this Lenten season we want to react and respond what do we do with this Jesus what do you do with It's the only dream inside of the entire Bible recorded by a woman that's mentioned. 
She's the only person inside of the entire crucifixion account that claims the innocence of Jesus. Maybe, just maybe, that is her later on in the early church. As she's come to faith, the one who's the Messiah has moved in her life and transformed her heart. Above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began, above all treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone. You lived and died, rejected How you took the fall and thought of me above all. Above all power. Treasures of the 
like a rose trampled on the ground. You took the fall and thought of me above Every one of us has individuals inside of our life. We have around us, God has placed them there. You never listen to me. Can't you just hear that inside of the palace? Pontius Pilate, Claudia. And to the best of our understanding, one who washes his hands. I don't want anything to do with Jesus, the Messiah. And one whose segments of the global church around the world recognize something happened in Mrs. Pontius Pilate's life that Claudia, perhaps her name is written down in the book of life. I'm not sure where you are in the midst of that continuum where we would blatantly just say, listen, I'm here this morning, but I really don't want anything to do with that, or whether you are in the process of understanding who Christ is, that he not only was the sinless Savior, but he's died for the salvation of the world and for your salvation and for mine. But as we continue with Christ, towards the cross these next few weeks. Certainly our prayer is that he would become much more alive to us during these days. Will you bow with me in prayer? We would ask this morning, Lord, as we find ourselves somewhere in the midst of the scene that we've talked about, maybe not blatantly calling for the death of Jesus, crucify him. Maybe not washing our hands of who he is and wanting nothing to do, but we're just not convinced. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would continue by your Holy Spirit to help us understand more about who you are and and how you want to have a relationship with us. And for many who are here this morning who find themselves convinced just like Claudia, that even today, not only we would recognize you are the one who's come for the salvation of the world, but then to we would continue to walk closely with you, even to the cross, and we might reconsider once again how it is you have died for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, today for being here in our time together of worship. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to our hearts, and thank you that as we go from this place, we don't go as people who are dismissed from your presence, but you go with us. And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, to whom honor power, majesty, and dominion belong now and forevermore. Amen. Would you go in peace?